Well, good morning. Uh, I've been having such a good time worshiping the Lord with you and listening to uh, the choir sing so wonderfully. I'm, sh I'm sure it has touched the heart of the Lord. It actually touched me so much that I'm glad that Pastor Benjamin got up to tell me uh, or remind me that I, that I had to get up and speak because I had actually forgotten that's why I came. Um, but look, uh, it, it's wonderful to be here to, for Marcy and myself to be with you again. We, um, we love to come. You've, uh, it's, it's a good thing to be asked to speak once. Uh, it, it's a really good thing to be asked to speak twice. Sometimes you don't get asked back. Um, but you've asked me several times, so um, I think we're friends. And, uh, and that's good to know. Although there is one thing that, that uh, has not been so good for me, and that is that since I started coming to this church, I've put on weight. And that is because the lovely ladies in this church have introduced me to Romanian cakes. And, um, you know, on Friday night, uh, after we had a, a, a dinner for the alumni of people who'd gone to Israel, and Marcy and I went there to Mount Carmel uh, in March, um, after the dinner, um, my family and I sat around the fire and talked and laughed and um, drank coffee and, and ate Romanian cake that uh, um, Amalia had made for us. And I have to confess that I also had some last night before I went to bed. So um, anyway, let's, uh, let's just um, pray before, before we begin. Um, Father... I pray that you will teach us this morning uh, by your Spirit. I pray, Lord, that uh, the eyes of our heart uh, will be enlightened, that you will grant us a spirit of wisdom and revelation that we might know you more. And Father, help us to leave this place thinking that it was good to come together in the house of the Lord to hear your word and to worship your holy name. Amen. Please be seated. I, I, um, I want to speak this morning on Israel. Now, I'm no, no expert in Israel. But, you know, um, Marcy and I, since we became Christians nearly 35 years ago, from the very beginning of our journey with the Lord, uh, even although I'd never met a Jew in my life, the Lord gave us an amazing affection for the Jewish people. And we kind of sought them out. Um, in fact, my secretary for many years was Jewish. And um, although not very observant, for example, when uh, I, she used to do my accounts and I'd uh, uh, make sure that she, she tithed from uh, the, the monies that I got, and she said, why do you do that? And I'd say, well, it's in your book. And so we'd have discussions uh, along those lines, but um, it's been a journey of understanding, and, and our visit to Israel in March really opened our, not just our natural eyes, but the eyes of our heart, uh, and put uh, quite a number of things in perspective. So as I asked the Lord for a message this morning for you, um, it wasn't just because Sarah was here, I didn't know what the Lord wanted, but Israel is what was on his heart for you. Now, part of this message, I have to tell you, is not easy listening. And I, um, I wondered whether I should even say some of the things that I, that I believe I should say. And so I have to say them. Because I believe that as Christians, we need to confront the reality of the history of the Jewish people and the reality of the history of the Christian church in relation to the Jewish people. And it's important we know that, not, not, not to make us feel guilty, but to understand the heart of God and our responsibility in the times that we live in towards this tiny, tiny, tiny little nation that is the epicenter geopolitically of the entire world. It's in the news every day. But it's also the epicenter of God's purposes in these times. So I pray you give me grace to to say what I have to say, particularly at the beginning, because, you know, even in our times, anti-Semitism is raising its ugly face again in Europe, 
particularly. The Jews have always been persecuted. It, it, it's, it's so unreasonable that they should have been treated so badly just for being Jews, but they have been. And Sarah mentioned this morning uh, of the Inquisition and the Crusades and the pogroms and the, the horrors of the Holocaust. Now, you know, that came mainly from the Christian church. How could it be? Well, I have looked into this, and you know, many of the early Christian church fathers wrote dreadful things about the Jewish people. I'm just going to mention two. One in the fourth century called John Chrysostom, and the second will be Martin Luther. Now, John Chrysostom is known as one of the greatest of the early church fathers. In fact, he was called the preacher with the golden mouth. He was so famous for his sermons and his addresses. This is something that he said. He said, the synagogue is worse than a brothel. It is the den of scoundrels and the repair of wild beasts, the temple of demons devoted to idolatrous cults, the refuge of brigands and debauchees and the cavern of devils. It is a criminal assembly of Jews, a place of meeting for the assassins of Christ, a house worse than a drinking shop, a den of thieves, a house of ill fame, a dwelling of iniquity, the refuge of devils, a gulf and an abyss of perdition. I would say the same things about their souls. As for me, I hate the synagogue and I hate the Jews for the same reason. My friends, this was a, one of the great fathers of the Christian church. How could he say such things? In the 16th century, Martin Luther, the great leader of the Reformation, the, the, the Protestant church protesting against corruption in the, in the Catholic church, at the beginning he, he, he was favorable towards the Jews, but because they wouldn't come to Christ, he turned on them in such a vicious way. He said this, amongst other things, he wrote a book called On the Jews and Their Lies. What then shall we Christians do with this damned, rejected race of Jews? First, their synagogue should be set on fire. And this ought to be done for the honor of God and for Christianity. Secondly, their homes should likewise be broken down and destroyed. Thirdly, they should be deprived of their prayer brooks. Fourthly, their rabbis must be forbidden under threat of death to teach anymore. Fifthly, passport and traveling privileges should be absolutely forbidden to the Jews. Let the government deal with them in this respect, as I have suggested. Do you know it was this, this writing, these writings of Martin Luther, that were used by Hitler and the Nazi regime in the years leading up to and during the Second World War as a vindication for what became the final solution the destruction of the European Jews. It did not come from Hitler. It came from the heart of a Christian leader, Martin Luther, and others who spoke like him. I could hardly believe it when I read these things. Now, now why, why have Christian leaders in the past felt able to write such vicious things about this people group called the Jews. Well, of course, behind it all, Satan may be seen. Satan has always wanted to destroy. He has always wanted to kill what God has purposed. And my friends, God's purposes in the beginning and all the way through and at the very end centrally involve the Jewish people. And now, if you don't know that, if you don't understand that, you need to understand that. That is why Israel is so important. I mean, in the days of Moses, the, um, Pharaoh ordered the Hebrew males to be thrown into the river, and Moses, of course, was saved, because God will always and has always preserved a remnant of the Jewish people. In the days of Esther, when Haman was seeking to the destruction of the entire Jewish race, 
Through Esther, the Lord preserved the Jewish people because out of the Jewish people came the Jewish Messiah, who is our Messiah. There's another reason, and this is, this is really what I want to get to this morning. That these dreadful things could be said and done has been justified by a heretical doctrine, a false doctrine called replacement theology. Sometimes it's called fulfillment theology or supersessionism. Basically, it goes like this. The, the Jews rejected Jesus as their Messiah. And so God has rejected them and poured out his wrath upon them and scattered them to the four corners of the earth and transferred the promises made to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and down through the ages to the Jewish people. He's transferred these promises from the Jewish people to the church, which they call spiritual Israel, and that God has no purposes left for the Jews. He is done with them. So why should we bother about them? That is replacement theology. It is an absolute heresy. It does not accord with the scripture of what God has said about these people. And this is the book that we need to look to. It may be accepted that in AD 70, when many Jews were dispersed, um, and the, the temple in Jerusalem was torn down stone by stone, and then later in AD 135, to all the corners of the earth for 2,000 years. Well, you know, what does God think and what does God say about the Jewish people? Now, to know that, you need to read this book and you need to read it carefully. Uh, read the book. Don't read some... American or British or European commentary about this book because you might find you've picked up a book that's filled with replacement theology. Read this book, this inspired book from God himself to us as people. And in this book, you'll find the truth. Well, I thought like any good story, perhaps we should go to the beginning, to the beginning of the book. Now, in Genesis, the very first words... Um, in the beginning, God. So we, we as a people, humans on the earth, we, we're introduced to some um, foundational truths that, upon which we can stand so that we understand life and, and our place in it. So in Genesis, we, in the very first line, we discover that there is a God. We discover that he's a God who created all things. We discover he's a God who instituted the covenant of marriage between a man and a woman. We understand from Genesis that, that, that man rebelled against God, sin entered the human race, and yet there in, in the same place alongside it, we see that the, the foretelling of of the salvation of man who would overcome the work of the enemy. And when you think about it, the existence of God, God the creator, marriage between a man and a woman, even just the concept of sin, all of these things, every one of them is under huge attack in our times. In Australia, in the United States, in England, in Europe, And something else is under attack, which we also find in Genesis. And it is the beginning of God's purposes of salvation to the whole human race. And it began with one man, Abram. Now, there were no Jews before Abram. Abram wasn't a Jew. Um, he, he came out of Ur of the Chaldees, which is modern-day Iraq. And the Lord told him, you know, to, to leave his home 
He says, get out of your country, from your family and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. I'll bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you, and I'll curse him who curses you. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And in Genesis 17, we read that God made a covenant with Abraham to give him and to his descendants as an everlasting possession, the land of which we now call Israel. It may not be, modern day Israel may not be as large as, as the, the promise. Who knows whether Israel will become larger. But where modern day Israel is, that is part of the land that God, in an unconditional promise and a covenant that he will never, ever, ever break, gave that land to Abraham and his descendants and a covenant repeated over and over again to his children, his grandchildren, and those who came after them. So when you hear governments talking about Israel giving land for peace, that does not accord with this book. It does not accord with God's purposes. In Zechariah we read that whoever touches Israel touches the apple of God's eye. Have you ever stuck your finger in the middle of your eye or had it poked? It's really painful. It's the most sensitive part of our eyes and that's how God thinks of Israel and the Jewish people. Because the descendants of Abraham became known as Judeans or, or, or Jews. And that's who they are. And, and that's who they are to this very day. In Jeremiah, the prophet in chapter 31 said that the Jewish people would exist as a nation forever. Now, now where did this book hasn't changed? Martin Luther had this book. John Chrysostom had these chapters. Where did their dreadful deceptions come from? that they visited on the church and somehow made the Christian th church think that they were the ones that God was now blessing. They were the ones that God loved. And the Jews, well, they could be cast out. This question, whether God has rejected the Jews, is not a new question. Martin Luther said with such confidence that God has rejected the Jews. John Chrysostom, God has rejected the Jews. Many of the Christian fathers, God has rejected the Jews. Paul considers that very question. The great apostle Paul, who by the way was a Jew, as were the, the apostles, the other apostles, as were almost all the writers of the New Testament. They were Jews who'd come to faith in Yeshua. The early church, the first believers, when Peter preached on Pentecost, most of them were Jews. But the Christian church has sought to distance itself from its Jewish heritage and the roots of the tree into which it has been planted. In Romans chapter 9, Paul addresses um, the question. And he does so with a heart full of sorrow, he says. A heart full of sorrow and anguish. Um, towards what he calls his people. And when he says his people, he means the Jewish people. Because he was Jewish. He said this in, in the anguish in which he was in his heart. I, I wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for the sake of my brothers. I, I wish, Lord, that you would, you would remove salvation from me and make me an accursed person. If, the, if, I, if I did that, would you save my brothers and sisters, my fellow Jews? 
my countrymen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom belong the adoption, the glory, the covenant, the giving of the law, the service of God and the promise. Paul did not say Israelites to whom belonged the giving of the law and the promises. He said whom belong. Like these promises are still promises to the Jewish people. You know, we, we break our, our word. We break promises. We can even break a covenant with God, like the covenant of marriage. People will break that covenant. God will never break an unconditional covenant. And he has made an unconditional covenant to the Jewish people. The one that he made to Abraham. They are in the center of his heart, brothers and sisters. And so they should be in our hearts. You should, you, you, you should sit down and read chapters 9, 10, and 11 of the Book of Romans and ask the Holy Spirit to help you to understand. When you do that, and when the Holy Spirit teaches you by revelation who they are and who they are to God and therefore who they should be to us and who they will be for God and what will happen in the end times, I believe it will change uh, the way you think about faith and the way you think about what's happening in the world as you watch the news and you, and you consider Israel. I know you pray for Israel and that, that is so good, but it, I think it's good that you understand why you pray for Israel according to the scriptures. In chapter 11, uh, at the beginning, Paul says this, I ask then, has God rejected his people? He's talking about the Jews. Has God rejected the Jews? And you know what his answer is? He answers his own question and he answers it with an amazing emphasis. He says, by no means. And there's an exclamation mark in my scriptures. And you probably find one in yours. It's like he's saying, look, absolutely not. He has not rejected the Jews. What did Martin Luther do when he came to that scripture? Did he just turn left and not watch it? Or, I mean, how hard is that to understand? Has God rejected the Jews? By no means. And then he, then he, he says, look, I'm an Israelite. I, Paul, I'm an Israelite. I'm a descendant of Abraham. He says, God has not rejected his people. Speaking of the Jews. Later in chapter 11, he says, I ask, therefore, did the Jews stumble in order that they might fall? Now, we all stumble at times. But by the grace of God, you know, we don't fall. He picks us up again so that we can keep on going. And what's the same with his, the Jewish people? Yes, they may have stumbled. They have stumbled. But they will not fall. God will always have a remnant. And Paul answers that question by no means. He says, because of their rejection, that is their rejection of Christ, you know, salvation came to the Gentiles. That's us. The, the trespass of the Jews in, in, in not accepting Christ has actually become riches for the non-Jewish world. But he says, look, if their rejection means reconciliation for the world, and he's looking ahead into the future, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? I mean, you know, to, to listen to Sarah describe, you know, the, the trials and difficulties, no doubt fear and anxiety that she had to live with as a young child growing up. I actually think, find it uh, truly ironic that Orthodox Jews should be breaking glass and firebombing churches, the very thing that happened to their synagogues. But in these times, since 1948, there has not just been life from the dead in Israel as the messianic congregations of which Sarah is a part are growing. Now, you may not think 50,000 
or 20,000 rather, is many people, but, but from what it was, that, that is amazing, and particularly with the hostility. You know, Aslan is on the move. God is on the move in that nation. But, you know, not just that nation. What's happening in Israel affects the entire world. Since 1948, the greatest, the greatest harvest has been occurring across the earth. Revival in South America, across Africa, in Southeast Asia, Korea, um, even in Vietnam and Cambodia, the, the, the Chinese church has just flourished since 1948. It's gone from a few million to more than a hundred million. There are more people who have come to Christ since 1948 when the nation of Israel was restored than in the entire history of Christendom. There is no coincidence that this has happened since the prophetic word of the Lord about the restoration of the land of Israel to the land, not some spiritualized Israel, physical, geographical Israel, right in the, that part that he gave where, where the, Abram went in the beginning, they are there today. And with the return of, of the Jewish people to Israel, there has been a blessing has flowed across the earth. It is no coincidence, I do not believe. And one of the places where the Lord is on the move, apart from Israel, is actually also in the Middle East. Now, what we see in our screens are the, and here on our radios are about all the people that get blown up by car bombs, but we don't hear on secular news how Tens of thousands of Muslims are coming to faith in Christ. I do not believe it's a coincidence that it's happening in the years since Israel was restored as a nation. Because Israel was chosen uh, as an example to the rest of the world, but also chosen by God to be a light to the nations, the Abrahamic covenant blessed in order to be a blessing. And at the moment, most Jews in Israel just want to be blessed. They want to keep it to themselves, what they think they have, those who have faith. But God is on the move. Actually, Sarah told me the other day that if you, if you say to a Jew that uh, in Israel that, you know, you, you're the chosen people, they they will often say, well, we wish he'd chosen someone else. <laughs> and I can understand that answer. I mean, it's kind of, it is kind of humorous, but, but there is underneath that humor that sense of, well, look, why, why has all this happened to us? So the Jews have, the regathering has begun nearly 70 years and two years' time. You know, even, even the language, Sarah mentioned the, the reality of the restoration of the land of Israel, the people to the land. You know, if you want evidence about the truth of the gospel, of this book, if you want truth about what God says, just look at Israel, the, the fact that it's been restored. And all the prophecies that said it would be restored, but it, you find in this book that, that it said that God would also restore the Hebrew language to his people in the land. You know, these people came from all over the world speaking Spanish and English and all, all the languages of the world because they, they had been there for 2,000 years not speaking Hebrew. I, I was in, with Marcy in Israel. You walk down the street and you hear everyone, everyone speaking Hebrew, singing in Hebrew. Not only has the land come to life and, and people are coming to life, this dead language has come to life according to God's word. And you know, my friends, this, of, all, of all the generations into which you could have been born, everyone in this room, you have been born at a time when multiple prophetic words of the greatest significance have actually happened in your lifetime. I mean, I just, you know, I thank the Lord for that. I, I was born in 1951. Israel was three years old when I was born. 
You know, what a joy to, to be there and to see this miracle of the Lord before my very eyes. The, the desert turned into a garden. And millions of people. Finally, some safe place for the Jews. My friends, this is, this is not politics. I'm not talking about the the Israeli government, I'm not talking about the strength of the Israeli defense force, I'm talking about the hand of God in our time bringing life from death, the dry bones rising up in our time. But still Israel has many enemies. And I think the reason the Lord wanted me to tell you what some Christian leaders had said in the past, which had justified the most horrendous conduct towards the Jewish people, is that today, with all the enemies that Israel has, my friends, Christians should not be found amongst them. We're called to be friends of Israel, to support the Messianic congregations and to pray for what God has purposed for that nation. You know, Marcy and I went to dinner uh, uh, with a very high-profile Israeli, an observant Jew, and he took us to the King David Hotel, which was a lovely experience. And he's a political commentator and very highly connected, and he used to be a client of mine many years ago. Um, and actually was one of the people responsible for uh, working with the then leaders of the Australian government and President Reagan and um, Gorbachev, I think, in bringing nearly one and a half million Russian Jews into the land of Israel. So there we were together and talking to him um, about how we love Israel, how God commands us to love Israel. Not in some silly romantic way. Actually, I find a lot of Jewish people very difficult, but you know that doesn't mean you don't love them. I find some of my family difficult, <laughs> but I still love them. And you know this this kind of tough Israeli. You know, in, if you think our politics is tough. You ain't seen anything till you've been in Israel. So this tough Israeli in his eighties seen many things, seen many terrible things. Sitting across the table from me, he said to Marcy and I, he said, you know, the only friends that Israel has in these times are evangelical Christians. You know, when he said that, my heart leapt because he's not a, he's, he doesn't, not a believer in Yeshua, but, but for him to say that is an amazing thing. And so the, the promise of God's blessing to those who bless Israel still holds good today. In fact, if we fail, to the extent you and I fail to bless Israel, then to that extent we will not enter into the fullness of God's blessings for us and our, our families and our communities and even our nation. So, um, what greater blessing at this distance from Israel can we bestow upon Israel than to continue to pray for her? So, I want to do that now with you, if you would stand up and I'll, I'll pray with you. Father, we thank you for your inerrant unchanging, unbreakable, trustworthy, reliable word, the scriptures. We thank you, Father, that you have revealed to us what is hidden from other men and women. I pray, Lord, that we would be diligent in our searching of the scriptures, that we would be like the Bereans who, who study the scriptures to see that that which we've been taught is true and accords with your word. And Father, your word is clear to us that you chose, you created and chose the, 
the descendants of Abraham, to be the special people, to be the, the ones who carried your covenants and your promises uh, and who, um, who were the vehicle through which you brought not only the prophets, but the greatest prophet ever, your son, Jesus Christ our Lord, the Yeshua, the Jewish Messiah who has become our Messiah. And Father, I thank you that, that, um, that our eyes have been opened to the truth. And Lord, may this not just be a, a message that we hear and we talk about and, and then go on to other things. May this be a message that uh, uh, finds good soil in our hearts, that when we're, even if we're driving or, or, or cooking something in the kitchen or wherever we are, that, that as Israel comes to mind, we will pray, Father, for your purposes, uh, your high purposes that are not only for Israel but for the whole world to unfold. Father, speak to us as to, as to how we may help, not just in praying but in practical ways. Um, Lord, if it was not for them, uh, where would our faith have come from? They carried it for thousands of years, and we're the beneficiaries. And so we thank you, Father, for your goodness to us. We pray a blessing upon the nation of Israel for her leaders, for the, the, the leaders of the Messianic congregations, for those in the congregations themselves, we pray. Lord, for encouragement and strength and comfort and joy that will be their strength. Uh, thank you for Sarah coming amongst us. Thank you that she's, the, she's a young Sabra, uh, uh, an Israeli born in Israel. And with a heart for you, Lord, and a heart for that nation. We thank you that she came amongst us and sang with us. And we send her from here with our blessing. In the name of Yeshua. Amen. Slavi să fie Domnul, vă rog să reocupați locurile. Mulțumesc pentru răbdarea dumneavoastră, chiar dacă am depășit timpul acesta, nu e necesar să traducă lucrul ăsta. Mulțumesc tuturor fraților și surorilor care au fost în dimineața aceasta la Casa Domnului pentru dragostea care am arătat-o și în acest fel față de acest popor al lui Dumnezeu, față de Fiul Său în mod special care a fost trimis în Lumea noastră în acest loc special de pe pământ, Israelul, cel mai frumos loc de pe pământ, așa scrie Biblia în cartea profetului Ieremia și uh, mulțumim tuturor oaspeților care în dimineața aceasta au fost cu noi aici, la închinare. În mod special, uh, we are so glad to thank our guests this morning, especially Pastor John and uh, his wife Marcia and the uh, Sarah coming to our church, choosing our church among all others, Perth churches. Could you imagine? She could go to an Australian church, but she chose the Romanian church. Just to have a glimpse of how Romanian, Romanian people are worshipping their Messiah, who is our Messiah as well, our Lord, uh, just to have a glimpse to see how we are singing to the Lord, how we worshiping, how we pray to the Lord. And we also like to thank all our uh, English-speaking guests, the uh, bass guitar and wife and uh, Luke and Jane and everyone. So uh, thank you for coming to us. Uh, Sarah, please take to uh, Israel all the good news about Romanians. Uh, I'm sure he, Jesus in heaven is having a special place where he will invite all of us, at least for the General Assembly. Yeah, and uh, if uh, you have any problem with our way of worshiping, I'm sure in heaven we all disappear. So, praise be the Lord. Uh, thank you for coming once again. Uh, whoever wants to take uh, some uh, CDs from outside, I reckon we can help this uh, mission uh, of uh, Friends of Carmel in Israel. So, God, may God bless us all. We have tonight another service. We pray for uh, Sarah and uh, other people having another uh, uh, conference meeting tonight, the last one. So she will not be in an Australian church. She'll be at the uh, conference and then leave for uh, Eastern States. God bless you, Sarah. God bless you, Pastor Gilmore, everyone. 
and see you tonight at 6 o'clock. God bless you all.